down the gifting panic alarm. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. And I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise Without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived When we shall leave this place There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place And I know Spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy. with your love and for these blessings we lift our hearts in praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place good morning and welcome on this Sunday. How is everybody? We doing okay? Amen. Amen. In the house sounds pretty good. If you're out watching us online, we welcome you today on this sunny Sunday, Palm Sunday. We know what that means. We're going to hear more about it. But oh, to be revived when we leave this place. Isn't that something to aspire for? A little short-term goal. We want to walk out of here revived. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's go, Mr. Dan. Days of Elijah. You guys know this song? Put your hands together, sing loud with us. Here we go. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness me. And though these are days of great trial 
salvation that we know is coming yet lord each and every easter season we welcome the story we welcome what leads up to brings us to this point and takes us beyond lord there is no room for dread or regret for those are thieves of joy and father we thank you for today bringing us that joy unspeakable as we gather in one of your many houses of worship full on pancakes <clears throat> but even more full on the holy spirit amen amen, amen. you may be seated this morning? Yeah, some of you did? Good. Nice to see all of you this morning. That's good. Well, today's Palm Sunday, and I was thinking about, like, things that we cheer for. Can you think of something that you cheer? You know, like, we cheer God, for sure. Definitely Jesus. Mary. Mary? <laughs> okay. You guys know the right answers in church for sure. Yes, yes. 
What else do we cheer? Do you cheer for a team? Yes. Yeah, what's your favorite team? Browns. 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 Or, or, yeah. Rangers. Rangers. Yes, that's right. The um, North Ridgeville Rangers. Yes. A pop star. Yes. Okay, good. We would cheer on, you know, like if we go to a concert, we may like have a favorite um, artist. Um, these are things that we cheer. Uh, have you ever been to a parade? Have you been to a parade? And so we kind of stand along the sides, don't, the sidelines, right? But we sometimes cheer. We cheer like if a fla the flag goes by, we often put our hands on our heart because we like cheer our, our country, that we live in a, a, a free nation, which you'll learn about more as you get older. Or there may be like if your ball team, if you're like in, on a sports team, sometimes they're in a float or our son was a boy scout, so they like walked in the parade. And so sometimes, but we're spectators. So we cheer things and we know about parades. Well, today is Palm Sunday and Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And as we kind of prepare for Easter, there's lots that happens during this coming week, what we call Holy Week. But the week began by people cheering Jesus. And back in the first century, we live in the 21st century, so a very long time ago, the, the word that everyone said was Hosanna. Everyone say, Hosanna. Hosanna. Well, you know, so I was thinking, like, today we would probably go, if we're, we're cheering, we're like, yeah! Can everybody do that? Yeah! Well, you said Hosanna better you, you, than you did, yeah. You're like, what is Pastor Sandra doing, right? Yes. Well, Hosanna means praise, yeah, um, hallelujah, glory, these may be words that we don't use like in our day-to-day -day words, but it's like cheering on our teams or artists. So we want to cheer on Jesus. So when Jesus was in this parade and all the people came along, they threw down their cloaks, which back in the first century, like you have a coat on, but just to kind of keep the dust off their clothes, they wore an outer garment, a cloak, and so one of the ways they showed honor, they celebrated, and they cheered Jesus was they took these outer garments off and they put them on the ground so that the dust wouldn't get up on Jesus. They wanted to honor him. They wanted to cheer him on because they knew Jesus had taught about love and he had helped people know about forgiveness. And even at, uh, no matter how old you are, it's still things that we want to learn about God. And so we cheer on Jesus. And so Palm Sunday is this day that we remember that Jesus is worth cheering for. And through Holy Week, we kind of like learn different things, but ultimately Easter teaches us the extent the, the, how big God's love for us is. But today we get to sing Hosanna, which in a way is just we cheer on Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, praise you, Jesus. We, we think you're awesome. You know, yay! Hosanna. So when we shout and sing Hosanna, it's a way for us to cheer Jesus for the love that he shows us from God. So um, let us pray, and then we're going to sing the last uh, bit of the uh, Elijah song as we parade back to Children's Church today. Okay? Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for all of us, each of these children. And we just pray that you help us to know your love so that we will cheer you, we will thank you, we will praise you for who you are, God's love revealed to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, palm branches, and they waved them, and they shouted Hosanna. And so that's what we're all going to do. Everybody get one? As you head to... Children's Church. All right. Pass one back there to Juju. Everybody get one. All right, everybody stand up. You ready? And we're going to pray it out. That's right. Miss Nancy's back here somewhere. Everybody get one. Oh, here he comes. Riding on the cloud. Shining like the sun. At the trumpet call. Lift your voice. Hear you believe. Rise on the salvation comes. Lift your voice.
May we all find ourselves praising the Lord for who he is, the love that he has for us. Hosanna. Yeah. Yay, God. All right. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful for who you are, for your faithfulness, for your steadfastness, for the love that you have for us. It's beyond our comprehension, yet this holy week kind of calls us to refocus and center ourselves, to reflect upon the depth of your love for us, that you would offer us your son. Help us, Lord, each of us to walk with you and let our praise be unending. May we not hold back in shouting hallelujah, hosanna, yeah, God. This is what my God does. He loves, he enters in, he forgives, he strengthens, he fills me with peace. Help us, Lord, to be your faithful witnesses for who you are and how faithful and steadfast you are. But we also recognize that throughout this week, we will be those that are, must confront our betrayals, our denials, our sin. So help us, Lord, to deal with our brokenness and, and to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And that when the world threatens to silence us, we will continue to be those bold uh, witnesses that proclaim your goodness, your grace, your mercy. So help us, Lord, to receive your forgiveness, to trust your transforming power to be at work within us. Just continue to bless us as we seek to be your community of faith. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to be a strong witness for you in our community, that others may come to know the love that you have for them because it flows through us, that we are those that continue to point to your light shining in our lives, that they too will come to know your light. Help us, Lord, to be about the work that you call us to and to trust you in all those difficult, dark places that exist in the world. We pray, Lord, that you will burst forth into those brokenness, into that brokenness, into those places where war and hatred seems to rule, that we wonder uh, where peace can be restored or how division stops. But we ask, Lord, that you be the one that is at work. Raise up leaders that will uh, guide and direct the people so that all will know justice, all will know peace, all will know the love that you have for them. We pray that you will break into the places of um, the brokenness and hurts and uh, pain, the disease that those that we love face and go through. And so, Lord, we pause and lift up to you those that are in need of your healing, and your encouragement, and peace this day. We especially pray for Jeanette and Nancy, for David and Randy, for William and Kylie, for Ava and Nyla, for Zach and Shirley, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You know, our hearts and our desire to trust you, be guided by you, those places that we have a hard time releasing. So Lord, just come and work within us, mold and make us into your likeness that we might indeed discover the depth of God's love for us revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. As he enters Jerusalem, may we follow him and trust him so that we will experience the joy and power of Easter dawn. We pray this in the blessed name of Christ, our Savior, and we pray as he taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do invite you to be a part of the ministry that we're engaged in as we seek to share the love of Christ with the world. This is Holy Week. We're grateful uh, for all the youth for, under Emily's guidance who shared with us uh, pancake breakfast and organized with Nancy's assistance and our education team, our egg hunt. Um, if we all get kind of a little sleepy midway through the sermon, we know it's because of the uh, syrup and pancakes. Not me. Because I'm the one up here who's also tired of sleeping because I had two of those pancakes. 
but we're grateful. And all the donations are in support of our youth uh, mission trip this summer to Iowa. So we encourage you to continue to find ways to plug in throughout this Holy Week. I look forward to our Thursday evening um, celebration. I think it's going to be a meaningful worship um, service. It's going to be held in our fellowship hall around tables. So I hope that you'll be a part of that. Friday, we'll be here in the sanctuary as we have the tenebrae or service of darkness, as we hear the passion narrative proclaimed. And next Sunday, um, I hope it's a morning like this, but maybe 20 degrees warmer. Uh, but the sun will, will rise, and we're going to be out at the pavilion as we um, welcome the sunrise at 7 a.m. and then have worship at 9 and 11. So I hope that you'll be a part of this Holy Week and maybe invite someone to come with you. That someone who needs to hear once more the story of uh, who Jesus is and the depth of God's love revealed uh, through him. So invite someone to come with you to all one, uh, many of our Holy Week services. We are grateful for opportunities that we have to share the love of Christ. And so as we receive our morning offering, may we reflect upon God's goodness, God's love for us, and uh, receive the invitation to be a part of what God do is doing here at Fields. So with it being Palm Sunday, as we know, we... We know that this is the week prior to Christ laying down his life for us, but even still, we tend to like to follow the liturgical plan, and sometimes we're uber strict, and we don't say hallelujah until, when is that? We're not supposed to say hallelujah, there's, I don't even know when, but it doesn't matter because God's a God of love, and he wants us to worship him all the time. I say all that to say the song that we are going to share tells the entire story. You've heard it before. I learned it 20 years ago, and it's still sticking to me. But it talks about everything that Christ is going to do for us, both in the here and now. Amen.
above, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. And thank you, dear Lord, for letting us be obedient to you, for opening up our hearts and listening the word in song, but also the words written. Blessed Father, I ask you to be with Pastor Sandra. Thank you, dear Lord, for her life. Thank you, dear Lord, for sending her to us. But especially for the words that you have placed upon her to share with us, for us to grow in those words, not only today, but always. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior, and thank you for forgiving us. In your precious name, I ask you and praise you and thank you. Amen. Today's scripture is John 14, verses 1 through 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? I am the way and the truth and the life, Jesus answered. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of our Lord. Well, throughout the Lenten journey, we've been looking at John's gospel and specifically the I am sayings of Jesus that we might come to a deeper understanding of our Lord. And it's unique to John's gospel. It's um, how Jesus kind of helped his followers understand who he was. So today, our passage is, again, a part of what we have termed Jesus' farewell discourse. And this begins with Jesus gathering with his followers at the beginning of Passover, the Passover festival. And in John's gospel, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He predicts their betrayal. Um, he includes uh, providing words of comfort to his disciples, which is part of today's passage that we'll explore a little more. He promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. He knows that he will no longer physically be present, and he knows that'll cause some, some uh, turmoil and stress, and so he promises the coming of the Holy Spirit, that even though I won't be with you, the Spirit will come and rest upon you. You'll, you'll be empowered, and you'll remember, and so Jesus predicts and promises the coming of the Holy Spirit. He prays for his followers, not just those that are present with him, but for those yet to come, including you and me. Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed that we would remain close to him, remain in his promises and in his word. And the farewell discourse then ends in John's gospel as Jesus leaves with his followers to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will be arrested, and the unfolding of Holy Week will continue to unfold. So in the context of John's gospel lesson for today, we have that Jesus is gathered with his followers for Passover. He has washed his disciples' feet. He has predicted that a betrayal, a betrayer is amongst us, and he has indeed dined with them, including Thomas, who asks questions and we know will kind of doubt later on if you know the story. We know the betrayer is at hand, and those that will deny him, he dines, he washes the feet of Peter and Judas and all those disciples who will flee from him in the hour of trial. Jesus gathers with those that will betray and deny, and yet he offers a new commandment, a new commandment to love 
This is the love that the one who is above will become the servant. He washes the feet. This was unheard of. We would still think the leader is, is kind of has a different category. But Jesus said, no, you love. Even be your betrayers and those that deny the, the forgiveness, the love that flows from God through Jesus is the commandment that Jesus offers to others. And so as we look at the I am saying, before us today as Jesus followers, we too must reflect upon those moments of our lives where we're called to love in a way that is kind of mind-boggling, to forgive, to love those that, you know, really we could struggle with, our enemies. How are we doing on that? Those that would betray us, those that would deny us, we're called to reflect upon that as we hear Jesus' words this day. So it begins in the context, as Kathy shared with us, Jesus' first phrase in the passage for us today to consider is, don't let your hearts be troubled. How's that work for you? If somebody just says, don't worry about it, do you stop worrying? I mean, it's easier said than done, right? I mean, we all have like challenges. Well, you can say, forgive my enemy, but you don't know my enemy. You don't know the hurts. Don't be troubled by that mistake you've made, but how do I get over it? Don't be troubled. Don't let the, the worldly things pressing in upon you weigh you down. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And we immediately could raise up our hands and go, well, but Lord... But Lord, but see, Jesus doesn't leave us hanging, doesn't just throw that out there and then leave it there. Jesus goes on to provide, again, comfort to his followers, seeking to instruct them. So we have to kind of lean into this, that we even begin with, don't let your hearts be troubled. We like, what? but Lord. But Jesus goes, you believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus says that in the midst of the troubles and, and fears and denials and betrayals, in the midst of your sin and your questions and all that will press in upon you, again, he's preparing that first crowd for what is to come. We know the things we face. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe God. Well, I'm, I'm asking you to believe me now. I need you to believe me. I've journeyed with you. I've sought to help you understand who I am. I need you to believe me. And then Jesus goes on to paint this beautiful image. I think I'm a, I'm a visual learner, so I like this image of his father's house. Well, many of us know this, perhaps I am saying more than any others, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we, we often think about the Father's house. Even there's a contemporary song in, in recent years, in my Father's house, it's a big, big house. You know, it's kind of a you know, catchy tune, big, big house. And we like that because there's room for everybody, right? There, there's a place. But Jesus is kind of like, in a way, helping the image of his father's house be that it's Jesus and God's unity. That Jesus comes to help all know there is a place. And how do we know there's a place? It's because Jesus is present to help us understand this unity that Jesus has with God. God is Jesus, right? And even for us, it's kind of like, how is that? And Jesus is God's son, and yet... Jesus is also God incarnate. How do we know God's love? Jesus. Jesus says, believe in God. I'm asking you to believe in me. And I'm going away. I must go to Jerusalem. I must go through crucifixion. I must be dead and buried in a grave so that I can rise again to give you the power and strength and victory that you need. I'm going to prepare that place so that you will have this power in your life. You know this way. Believe God, believe me. But it's Thomas who speaks on behalf of me and maybe you when he goes, Lord, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Remember Willis? Just that age group out there. What are you talking about? We don't know where you are going. 
How can we, how, what are you talking about? Even after they have journeyed with Jesus, after they have witnessed all that he has done, after they have listened and sat under his teachings, they're still like not quite sure what it is that is unfolding in their midst. So Jesus responds, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe God, I'm asking you to believe me. And when you're just confused and you're not sure, you gotta hear me say, well, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. We've lived into these other I am sayings these past few weeks of confirming this new commandment, this new relationship, this invitation that Jesus offers to us. I am the vine. We're invited to remain in Christ, right? To receive our nourishment, to abide, to be nourished by the teachings of Jesus. I am the bread of life that we're sustained by being close to Jesus. I am the gate. Jesus is the one that enters us into the presence of God. We flow in and out into the world, but we remain in Christ's presence. I'm the good shepherd, Jesus said. Trust me to be your leader. And now in his final moments, in his final gathering with his followers, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You believe God, I need you to believe me. I need you to believe me. Now the way that Jesus is is not geographical. It's because I can hear Thomas, it's like, okay, well, like, which road are we taking? I'm, I, I, wanna, I like, want to stay with you, but like, where exactly are we going? It's not geographical. And even this image of heaven, right, I go to prepare a place. Well, that's a future, right? It's, it, that's invitation. But it's more about the relationship, the revelation that I go to prepare all that so that it will be your reality now. Jesus as your way now is not just a future promise of a heavenly kingdom that is restored and we're renewed and we're whole. The Revelation passage, Revelation 21, there is no more crying or or there is no more sorrow or crying or pain. The old is behind us, behold the new. Yes, that is our promise, but Jesus is saying, I'm your way now. He goes to prepare that place so that we live into that power and life, that victory now. Jesus says, no, you believe God? I need you to believe me. He's planting the seed for what is to come. We know the story. How is Jesus your way? How is he the one that comes in, in the indwelling within you that you can take up residence? You can be in God's house today that God comes and takes up residence so that you will live in this victory and this promise today. Don't be troubled. Yes, troubles come, but when you're intimately connected with God, you always have a way forward. You always have a way through the darkness, when Jesus is the way, not just like searching and figuring out, well, how do I go here? But it's like God can redirect. God is at work. You step over the line, God is there to help us. That's if Jesus is the way, not just a direction or a guide, but the way, the person, the purpose, the relationship that we need. Don't be troubled as we seek to follow and trust Jesus to abide within us and be the way. And when Jesus is the way, we meet the truth of God. The truth of God. We live in a world that just throws all kinds of things at us and begins to make us wonder, what is the truth? What is it we're supposed to believe? What is that? Jesus came to make clear the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's how John's gospel begins. God comes to be the truth within our lives. Jesus says, I have not come to condemn the world, but that the world will be saved through me. 
God is for you, not against you. That's the truth. That's the truth that guides us, that Jesus abides in us to help us in the midst of the confusion and the uncertainties of our lives to know the truth of God who desires our victory, who desires that we trust and experience the wholeness of God. Jesus says, I have not come to destroy or abolish the law. I have come to fulfill it. Jesus comes to fulfill all the promises God offers for God's people. God's divine plan, God's divine purpose is that we would know God fully, that we would live in that wholeness and in that that relationship with God. And yet we have trouble, don't we? We live in a broken world. We have all kinds of things that press in upon us. So Jesus says, you believe God, I need you to believe me. Let me be your way in dwelling, unite you with God. Trust my truth to help you even in the midst of of falsehoods and lies that you'll know my truth, that then you will discover the life that God desires for you to know. That's the ultimate gift that Jesus brings, that we will know life as God designs. Gerald Sloyan, in his commentary on John, writes that the heart of the good news in John's gospel is that Jesus, the incarnate God, that is becoming flesh, God with us, the Son of God, is one that we can see and know in a manner that was never before possible. I mean, a God who would leave the heavens to become a person, who would walk the earth, be condemned, die on a cross, that's a manner of love that we could never comprehend. And yet that's what Holy Week invites us to receive a manner of love that has never before been possible. Now, Jerusalem during the first century probably had around 40,000 people. But when the um, festivals, the holy festivals uh, unfolded and people began to come to Jerusalem for Passover, it would swell to about 200,000. So picture living in a community, say, like around Cleveland, and there's a solar eclipse coming, and everyone wants to come, okay? So it's Jerusalem, 40,000, but because it was the holy city, people would come from all over the area to be in Jerusalem for the Passover, a Jewish holiday still celebrated because it's God's deliverance of God's enslaved people in, in Israel, it's how, in Egypt. It's how the Israelites were led out of captivity. It's the God of deliverance. And so Passover begins by remembering and celebrating how God saved the Israelite nation. So as Jesus and his followers came to Jerusalem. Jesus was Jewish, and so he would have made his way into Jerusalem for the holy uh, celebration for Passover. Jesus rode in on a colt, and, and we didn't read that passage, but I call your attention to the story of Jesus coming in, an unridden colt, a donkey perhaps, but it was pure, and he rode in, and he came from Nazareth. He was a, a peasant in upbringing, so probably most of his followers were peasants, So it's a humble entering into the city. And yet the people began to come out and to celebrate because you see, Jesus was someone to begin to cheer. He had been lifting up the broken. He had been offering forgiveness of sins apart from sacrifices in the temple. Jesus uttered a word of forgiveness to people. What? Some of the people would would have said that that it was different than what the teaching was. Jesus was incarnate of God. He was healing people. He raised Lazarus from the dead. People began to come and sit under his teaching because they knew that something was happening. Is this the promised Messiah? So he humbly enters into the city and people came out to cheer 
to shout Hosanna, to offer praise. Could this be the promised Messiah? Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan, in their book, The Last Week, each day of Holy Week and, and kind of help set the context of the first century. And in their book, in their explanation of Palm Sunday, they talk about two processions happening in Jerusalem that day. We have Jesus entering in humbly with his peasant gathering around. But there would have also been an imperial procession. We're not as familiar with this as followers of Christ. We emphasize Jesus' entry. But the imperial procession was well known in the Jewish homeland in the first century. It was the standard practice of the Roman governors of Judea to be in Jerusalem whenever there was festivities, whenever people were coming. They wanted to make sure everyone knew who was in charge. They wanted to have a showing to make sure that everyone understood where the power was. They had no real interest, perhaps, in the religious devotion of the Jewish nation, but they wanted to have a presence in the city so that, you know, there's not going to be any trouble here because there was a show of force, a show of power. The mission of the troops with Pilate was to reinforce the Roman garrison that was stationed around the Jewish temple and its courts. So you can practice your religion all you want, but meanwhile, we're over here making sure you know who's in charge and where the power really is. We have Roman soldiers, right, positioned around. And so Borg and Crossman write about how this other parade, this other procession was also taking place in Jerusalem. So as Jesus humbly enters in with his followers... Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, would have also been entering into the city. He was in front of his cavalry and soldiers, and we envision a big show of force with weapons and armor. I kind of picture, you know, the drums and the swirling of, of, of just, you know, stomping feet. As people drew attention, make no mistake who's in charge where the power is. Even leaders, what they rode mattered, and probably the Pontius Pilate and those who entered into the city would have been on, on big animals, maybe horses, which were, were signs uh, meant war, power being lifted up. We're in charge. We're the ones in power. Jesus entered on an unridden colt, which was a symbol of peace and a leader leading with peace. Do you hear or do you see the contrast? Can you feel it? There's a tension in the city. The Romans, who's in charge? The power, a display of power. You can all come for your festivities, but we're the ones in power. Jesus humbly enters in. And in a way, the contrast, the domination system being contrasted with Jesus' humility and a new commandment I give to you, love. Love. Help those who are down. Love. Sacrifice. We know that this tension will unfold throughout the week. It will come to blows as Jesus' kingdom emerges and in the midst of that, we hear Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the midst of the struggles and the challenges and the tensions of the world, there will be conflict, but I'm your way. I'm your truth. I'm your life. You trust God, I'm asking you to trust me. You believe God, you need to believe me. His kingdom, his direction, his truth, his life, will conflict against power struggles and issues and troubles of the world in the first century as well as today. So where are the conflicts of our day? Russia, 
that news from yesterday. I mean, there's terrorism. There's, there's all kinds of war, the Gaza Strip. Where are the conflicts of today? Inner cities, where their violence erupts, even in our community. Tension of political divide. We can easily be provoked in our generation, in our day, by phrases. We hear a phrase like woke or white supremacy, and every, oh, we, it just pokes us. We can be fearful. We can be fearful of what we hear about the division, and we, we fear for our communities, for our nation, for our schools, for even our denomination. We live in a, a culture, in a, an era where there's growing uh, lack of, of trust in our leaders, lack of responsibility in institutions that we once cheered. We can become overwhelmed and disillusioned and frustrated and angry and trouble just weighs us down. Do you ever feel troubled? Jesus proclaims, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. I'm asking you to believe in me. My father's house has many rooms. I'm going to go. I'm going to put all, I'm going to go through all the actions. I'm going to do what I got to do in order for that you can be united with God. I need you to believe in me that I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I need you to believe it. So in the midst of all the challenges, in the midst of the tensions and destruction that presses in upon us, we enter into Jerusalem with Jesus. We follow, we sing our hosannas, we sing our praise, and the challenge of the week is that we don't allow anything to silence that praise. Now, in the midst of the week, we're going to be those that must confront our denials and our betrayals and our brokenness and our sin, but we follow Jesus and we sing our hosannas. We shout, we need you, Lord, to be who you are. Jesus enters Jerusalem and we walk with him. We throw our love at his feet. We cheer him on. We recognize in ourself our brokenness and our needs. We recognize we stumble and we falter and we're wrong and we're insensitive. We're impatient. Yet Jesus still enters Jerusalem. Oh, will we sing his praise? Will he still be the one that helps us in the midst of the conflicts that we encounter so that we can know life? Truth, unity with God. So, and this is the holiest of all weeks, my friends. So, it may it be a week full of discovery and reassurance that in the midst of the things that trouble your heart, in the midst of the twists and turns and challenges that weigh you down, may you follow Jesus to Jerusalem so that you will discover the victory that comes from one who confronts the evils and uncertainties of the world to offer you victory. The Apostle Paul was the one that proclaimed to the early church in Rome, who can separate us from this love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword, can the voices that shout into my life that I'm unworthy, may the divisions of the world lead me away from you, Lord? Can all the troubles that pile up on my heart separate me from your truth, Lord? No, Paul says. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. You see, nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God revealed in Christ who entered into Jerusalem. 
And even when the cheering stopped, he fulfilled God's plan that you and you and you and you, we all can know victory. Jesus said, you believe in God? I need you to believe in me. Let me be your way and your truth and your life. May it be so, not just this holy week, but always. Let us pray. Lord, help each of us to walk with you, to, to cheer you for being our Lord and Savior, and help us, Lord, in the midst of all the things of our lives that would trouble us and weigh us down and silence us to keep following you. Be our way. Come and abide in us, Lord. Take up residence that we will know your truth, even when falsehoods speak into us and we are uncertain of the direction or we have fallen away, you will speak words of forgiveness and hope and life into us that indeed we will discover your power and victory. Let our hosannas, our alleluias, not be silenced. Instead, speak into us words of victory. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Let's stand, shall we? So, Pastor Sandra has given us the tools. We are ready for this week. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen, but we can't do it without Christ. So, we're gonna, the ladies don't even know we're going to do this, but we're going to sing the chorus to give me oil in my lamp, which is sing Hosanna. So, we're going to sing some Hosannas. You're all going to catch on. It's sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. It's pretty simple. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Very good. Those are the Hosannas. Sing them loud. Yay, Jesus. Amen. 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 Mr. Dan. <laughs> remember Hosanna praise who is it that you will follow may you follow the one that is the way the truth and the life and may that give you victory this day and every day amen Oops.